Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Union of Political Science Students at the New School for Social Research to this year's Graduate Student Conference. Uh, given the events of the past year or so here and around the world, we've all been thinking about and working on emerging political phenomena anyway, so this year's theme of new political movements was quite easy to decide on. We put together seven rich and timely panels for you, examining and theorizing events and actors from Latin America, the Middle East and North Africa, and the United States, as well as those right here at the New School. We hope you'll join us for these and other panels tomorrow, which you'll find listed in your programs available here. Uh, and for a reception following this keynote roundtable with dinner and drinks. The conference organizing committee is thrilled to introduce Paul to the politics firm's newest member, Tarak Barkawi, as the moderator of this keynote roundtable. Professor Barkawi comes to the New School after a 10-year stint at the University of Cambridge, where he established himself as a prominent scholar of the role of armed forces in the colonial, post-colonial, and globalized spheres. Uh, several of us on the committee are enrolled in his War in Society and World Politics class this semester, and he's already shown himself to be an, emer an engaging and involved, yet challenging professor, both in and out of the classroom. I speak for all of UPSS when I say that I can't wait to be a part of the exciting results of Professor Barkawi's involvement in the department. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tarek Barkawi. Thank you, Stephanie. It's my pleasure to moderate a panel on how and why new political movements are emerging today. And we have three much more distinguished guests than myself to speak to this issue. To my right is Drusilla Quinnell, who is a professor of law, women's studies, and political science at Rutgers University. She has a long uh, history as a labor organizer. Before that, she's a published playwright. And she's written on feminism, critical theory, um, ethics, uh, postmodern theories of ethics. And uh, I see her also organize conferences on deconstruction and justice with Jack Derrida. Uh, to Drusilla's right is Todd Gitlin an American writer, sociologist, communication scholar, novelist, poet, and a not very private intellectual, it says on the, the bio here, uh, very active in SDS during the 1960s, has worked as a journalist and writer, uh, and is now professor of journalism and sociology and chair of the PhD program in communications at Columbia University. Also at Columbia University, and to Todd's right, is Professor Hamad Dabashi, uh, Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia, written more than 20 books, edited four, 100 essays, articles, and book reviews. That's, that's a lot of writing. Uh, and a very active uh, teacher and commentator. Uh, and two of my uh, colleagues from grad school have recently put together a collection of his work, The World is My Home, a Hamid Dabashi Reader, which I recommend to all of you. Without further ado, each of our speakers will get 15 to 20 minutes. I will rigorously silence them at 20 minutes. Uh, they will then have a chance to question each other, and then we'll go to the audience uh, for Q&A. Uh, thank you so much for um, inviting me to participate in uh, this round table. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the Shanty Dwellers movement in South Africa. And I should say, for the reason I'm talking about the Shandy Dwellers Movement is that um, I run a project in South Africa now for the last 10 years called the Ubuntu Project. And the Shanty Dwellers are part of the Ubuntu Project and uh, they participate in what they call in English living communism, but in African languages, revolutionary Ubuntu. Um, the Ubuntu Project, including myself, I taught at the Kennedy Road University and um, I spent several uh, weeks living in the shanty town, particularly participating in the organization of women uh, in the, sh the shanty town movement. Um, in terms of Occupy Wall Street, I've been very involved with the group that I formed with Anne Snitow in 2002 uh, to protest against the bombings of Afghanistan and to support the Revolutionary Association of Afghan Women as a government in exile uh, that should have been allowed and recognized by the UN as such. Uh, so we will be marching on May 1st. Many of the women or men in this room would like to join us and we'll be teaching a class in IQU. Um, I know our question is how do movements start and uh, how do they sustain themselves? And I think there's lessons from the Shandy Dwellers that are relevant not just to the movements in South Africa but to all of us. Uh, the, there was a, um, the Shanty Dwellers movement began in uh, the Kennedy Road 
uh, shanty town by the Clare Estates, which is a um, Indian upper class development uh, in the city of Durban in KwaZulu Natal, which is a province of South Africa. Uh, and they actually had appealed to the ANC government to not be evicted. Uh, the anti eviction movements and campaigns in South Africa have been very strong. For those of you who don't know much about South Africa, uh, Mandela was elected president in 1994 after a long and bloody civil war. There was nothing miraculous about the transition. And of course, now famously, has been, Nancy's been criticized for complete capitulation to neoliberal capitalism. Um, out of negotiations with the government, the shanty dwellers of Kennedy Road, at that time, which included um, three different shanty settlements. Uh, these settlements are always on uh, private properties, I mean, owned by someone else. Um, that they formed a Kennedy Road Development Committee to negotiate with the government. On March 19, 2005, the bulldozers showed up anyway after a promise by the local councillor that they would not be evicted. And at that time, they chose to occupy a park and barricade themselves uh, and fight the police and hold the line against the police for five hours in what was quite a, uh, a bloody battle. Seventeen were arrested. Um, on March 21st, which is Human Rights Day, there was a demonstration of 1,200 uh, shanty dwellers now joined by two more shanty towns in this, in this same area. Uh, demanding that all of the demonstrators be arrested or those who were in prison be let out. In fact, Sabu Zakoti and the other 17, Sabu Zakoti was soon to be elected president of an organization that comes out of this. Now, there, there, he, at this point, he gives a speech which has now become famous in the Shanty Dollars movement, now a national movement, where Sabu Zakoti said the first Nelson Mandela was Jesus Christ, the second was Hori Tata which is Mandela's real name, Mandela. The third Nelson Mandela is the poor people um, of the world. On May 5, 2005, the people from Kennedy Road and five other settlements marched uh, into Durban, insisting on what David Harvey calls the right to the city, using his slogans. They'd already set up their university and um, had developed a library with the help of uh, radical intellectuals in the neighboring university of KwaZulu Natal. Their uh, demand there was to be remain on the land and to be able to have free water and free electricity both in the commons. Um, they had allied themselves with the Light Up movement and the Ubuntu electricians who are a nationwide organization that simply turn on your electricity if it's turned off and you can't pay your, your bill. Uh, this march was also met with uh, great police brutality. However, the shanty dwellers movement managed to split the police, meaning half of the police joined the shanty dwellers demonstration and half fought it. Um, uh, so the appeal there was explicitly to try to bring the police to their side. This is a long um, a lesson of the, the struggle against apartheid and the civics that uh, the police and the army are mainly scared young people and have got a real chance of bringing them over. And they saw this as a, a crucial movement. And this is something I actually think that we need to be thinking about here. What is our relationship to the police, given the, the extreme cutbacks that they've, they've suffered? Um, out of the, the, uh, these events of 2005, a Bahalahi Ba Mojondo was formed as an organization now of 12 settlements with about 12,000 members. Now, each of the, the 12 settlements um, elected representatives to the Kennedy Road Development Committee, which meets daily, and it continues to meet daily, so it's been meeting daily now for seven years. Um, in the way the shantytown movements are organized is that there are bi-weekly meetings, and the bi-weekly meetings, like say, I've spent time and lived in the Kennedy Road settlement, so I'm going to just give you a sense of what it is. The bi-weekly meetings discuss everything from the sustainable um, food growth in the collectively run gardens. Uh, a collectively run child care center was created and run by both women and men, not just those who have children. There was also a real attempt to reach out intergenerationally to those older people who are simply unemployable within the economy as a whole, to um, both employ them in vegetable gardens uh, as leaders, as elders, 
and is also to, to work in the child care centers. Um, all, they've been formed a, a university. Um, the university runs uh, almost every night. The classes are usually taught by shanty dwellers themselves. I was asked to teach a class on, on the first volume of Capital. Had some of the best students I've ever had in terms of, uh, of reading Capital. Um, the bi-weekly meetings make the, govern the entire shantytown. So every possible decision comes to that shantytown. And I want to give the extreme examples of that so you understand that revolutionary Ubuntu, which is for living communism, is the way they see themselves living now. Um, there was a child born to one of the women, and this child uh, was born without a spinal cord. And the decision was that this should come before the meeting as to whether the child should be given a mercy killing or the child should be raised as a human being. That was seen as a political and ethical decision. The decision was to raise the child as a human being, and the child was assigned uh, 12 parents. As to raise a child like that is a big undertaking. Uh, so that even a decision about birth and death was seen as one that should be made in terms of local governance. There's no such thing as a single mother uh, in the Kennedy Road settlement. That's something that as a single mother left me with great envy. Um, so when I say every matter before this um, shanty town, not just how you're going to organize your next demonstration, but how you're going to live your daily life. Now, one of the, the things about that is, is, is twofold. First, um, there's constant support in a spatial area. They have now won the right to stay on the land. Um, it took them seven years, but they are now a permanent settlement, and nobody's moving them. And the government of Durban has accepted them. Um, secondly, because of that support, there's also a structure to the campaigns they may lead. In 2006, 2008, 2010, they had a huge campaign that in uh, 2008 became nationwide, uh, which was no electricity, no land, no water, no boat. Now, they didn't just, in the Alan Badu sense, say, you can subtract yourself from the state. Not at all, because in a certain way that the, the Sabu Sakoni's quote is saying, we are the, the state, we, but basically, the new South Africa is the mobilization of a radical idea of sovereignty of the people. And so they are the new South Africa. That's what they say to the police. You know, when you can't fight us, we're the people. Um, and the other thing is that the state of South Africa, the new constitutional dispensation, is not something they necessarily withdraw from. When they did their no vote campaign, it was a campaign. It wasn't just a bunch of people sitting at home not voting. It was going to the polling places, swarming them, using that word deliberately, uh, a word of racial fear in the apartheid era, swarming them, and saying, march with us, because the ANC, until it shows that it hasn't betrayed the, the demands of the people, of which we are the people, um, there's no way they're going to get our vote. Now, um, there's two things about that are important, because we oftentimes hear you know, about the state being over and the nation being over. Many of the shanty dwellers are ANC members, not all, but many. Um, so there's a constant debate about whether you know, they're going to take over the ANC leadership or whether there needs to be a second revolution or whether you need to have state power. These are issues. Um, and the nation and the state, remember, aren't the same. The nation is a mobilization of radical sovereignty of the people in Fanon's sense. Um, these are all readers of Fanon. It's not just me who's bringing Fanon to them. You might say it was them that brought Fanon back to me. Um, secondly, the state is a new organized constitutional dispensation, and they have brought two lawsuits against eviction nationally to the Constitutional Court. The first they lost by one vote on the Constitutional Court, but the Joe Slovo eviction was never ordered because the uh, anti-eviction campaign became so powerful. Police went over to the side of the demonstrators again, and the result is that Parliament said, okay, no eviction. Now they have another case before the Constitutional Court. Now this is relevant for two reasons, because whatever you think of the ANC's sell-up, it holds hegemony as a revolutionary party, and they mobilize people to fight in a revolutionary movement. Disease state power, it's very hard to demobilize people once you've mobilized them. And when they, the entitlement 
that is represented by the Constitution is felt very strongly. We are entitled to water, we are entitled to land, we are entitled to electricity. This is what our Constitution says. And so in a certain sense, we are demanding that this, the, the nation recognize the sovereign power of the people, which is what Mandela promised, statement, we are the real Mandela. And secondly, that the state itself is supposed to represent this radical Rousseauian legislative people in action. And said, if it doesn't, then we're going to demand that it meet that. So there's a very complicated relationship to the nation and the state in South Africa uh, in the Shanty Dwellers movement that I think we can learn a lot from. Um, and particularly as we face an election here, are we going to just sit home individually and not vote? Or are we going to swarm the polls? What are we going to do in terms of making it some kind of um, uh, political statement? Now, saying this, I somewhat disagree then with Slavoj Zizak's view of the Shanty Dwellers movement worldwide, where he says it's autonomy without power. If you win, that the government of Durban, your local city council, says, okay, you're, we're never moving you off the land, that is an exercise of power and uh, a huge victory. And this is another lesson I think we need to learn, which is the lessons of claiming victory when you've won a victory. They said, this is our land, and the land developers said, no, it's owned by a, a group of uh, private owners and developers. And ultimately, seven years later, they have, the developers have to give them the land for free because they're not moving anywhere. And they had a huge celebration about that, a nationwide celebration. People were, um, came from all over the country to join the celebration. Uh, it went on for two days. Um, so the, another lesson to learn from them is when you win something, pay attention to it. And, and so I disagree with Zizhak when he says these are movements that exercise autonomy. Yes, I've described the autonomy, the self-governance, the day-to-day -day dailiness of it, but also there's times when you go and you say we're not moving and we want legal state recognition that this is now our land and we want a certificate which they got that they are now legally on the, the land. So it's not autonomy without power and nor is it a movement that necessarily divorces itself from party politics. I say necessarily because it's a constant debate about what their relationship to the African National Congress is because you have the irony that it is a party that only holds legitimacy by its revolutionary claims, even if they have sold them out, they still have no ability to say, we are the party of neoliberal capitalism. So this leads to a form of confusion on the part of the state's action, and they constantly debate what to do with that confusion, how to take advantage of it. So again, it's not like, for closing something I think we might need to discuss in the United States around Occupy Wall Street. Well, are we going, what are we going to do in terms of party politics? Are we going to form a new party? Uh, if that should be a serious question, not just a, a no, we can't form a new party, but what kind of uh, party are we going to form? So, um, and secondly, what is the relationship to the new constitution, which is uh, seen by many as the most progressive in the world. It's the only constitution which has full horizontal application, meaning that if you did something to me, I could sue you. There's no issue of standing. You could come in and say you have an opinion about this because you're a, a citizen of a new dispensation. Only constitution in the world that allows citizens to negotiate legally. No state action, none of the verticality of our constitution. The second is that social economic rights are fully enforceable as any civil rights. Again, the only constitution in the world has made that move. Now, the shanty dwellers do not see these as bad things. They see these as things that have entitled them, and therefore they should go to the South African Constitutional Court, not just on their own behalf, because they never went to the Constitutional Court on their own behalf. They went to it on behalf of other shanty towns. And they went to it on behalf of other shanty towns because they collectively pooled their money and sent two people to law school, who are now seen as the people's lawyers of the shantytown, who uh, devote themselves entirely to bringing constitutional lawsuits. Uh, so, and this was a decision of who was going to go. One was a woman, I'm pleased to say. There's absolute acceptance that all um, bodies in the um, shantytown 
movement must be 50% women. And like I said, there's, you know, men have to do their share of time in the, the child care centers to make sure that the women who are mothers can be in those meetings. Um, so again, there was a, dis a, a discussion about what do we do about law? How do we think about rights? What do, and what do we do and how do we uh, negotiate the, the new, new dispensation? Um, now at this time, there's another, I think, a big lesson in the, um, the Shanty Dwellers movement, which is that it has become national. It's moved um, out of Durban, it has formed alliances, and has now developed a movement of the poor. It's um, unified with what is a colored movement in South Africa called Chattiswar, which is uh, what this book is about, also in Durban. And the way in which space plays out is the name of Kennedy Road or Chattisworth. They become, they're actual shanty towns, but they also become a name for a different kind of politics. But the politics that I'm describing to you is extremely complex. It moves from an understanding of local autonomy, horizontality, many of the, the words we hear in Occupy Wall Street, to a complex relationship to the ruling party, to other parties like the Emphatic Freedom Party, which played such a role and secondly to the new constitutional dispensation. Uh, so that you have a complex kind of verticality. Now, one of their issues when they did the boycott the elections campaign is they needed to be a national presence. And even though they boycotted that campaign, they've now decided to run two shanty dwellers for parliament. In other words, as long as there's a standing parliament in South Africa, then the shanty dwellers can be part of that too. So in other words, it's never just a drop out and organize amongst yourself. It's a constant negotiation of how you make yourself a bigger and bigger presence, how you actually succeed in delivery. I mean, they now, they had six taps that Kennedy wrote. They now have 273. Now, for 5,000 people, you may say 273 is way too few. They think so too, but it's a lot more than six. They now have the garbage picked up by the city of Durban. Why? Because they're legitimately on the land. And they did a huge celebration about that when the garbage trucks first came in and asked the workers to come join in a big feast, a lot of a go, you know, let's, let's join together as you come to pick up your garbage. But before, make sure you get with the people and have something to eat. So what I wanted to bring to you tonight is the complex politics of a movement that is now nationwide that yes has a better situation in terms of being in a country that's had a revolution and a history of revolution in the recent past but I think has a lot to teach us about not making sweeping generalizations but working to think through how we can actually have an effective challenge to the advanced capitalist country that we live in and controls our government. Thanks. Stephanie Taylor for kindly inviting me and including me in this conversation. And I'm very pleased to be here invited by Union of Political Science students at the U School. I wish, um, I believe our students also voted to become unionized up in Colombia, but they were not allowed the votes to be counted. And uh, if the votes were to be allowed to be counted, we will also have student unions up in Colombia. Now, uh, the response, how do they start revolutions and how do they sustain themselves? I will talk about mostly what is known <coughs> as Arab Spring. I just finished a book on the Arab revolutions, which as you know began uh, late in 2010 and has been ongoing. And uh, the answer to the question, how do they start, well, the proverbial answer is, is it started by a fruit peddler setting himself on fire in Tunisia, Muhammad Wazizi. And uh, as you well know by now, that act of public, decidedly public self-immolation started the uh, Tunisian uprising. 
And when the, the uprising began, there was no name for it. In fact, initially it was called Tunisian uh, uh, Jasmine Revolution. But very soon, a uh, leading Arab intellectual, Azmi Bishara, decided that they don't want to have a color revolution and dispense with that Jasmine Revolution uh, specification. And soon after that, any number of names were applied to these movements, Arab Spring, uh, Arab uh, revol re Revolutions, and also one other name that was again immediately dispensed with was Arab <coughs> Awakening, as if the Arabs were asleep and needed to be awakened. That Arab Awakening has been uh, dispensed with. Now, the, going back to the uh, public self emulation of Muhammad Muazizi, obviously, immediately, that uh, what points to is precisely the economic condition of Tunisia that was effectively the extended market of uh, France and very much part and parcel of the new liberal econom uh, economics and in fact considered to be a high achievement of in North Africa along with Libya which was named the Norway of North Africa by some professors who were paid up to three million, watch your rates, three million dollars a year to write Solid, uh, uh, laudatory uh, appreciations of Muammar al uh, uh, facilitated by a PR uh, firm. Uh, so uh, after that, as you know, uh, the, um, uh, 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 Zillah Abin Ibn Ali resigned and the uh, Tunisian revolution succeeded. And it began uh, an effect which is both good but also could be misleading in terms of our understanding of it, namely what happened in, in Egypt. Now, it is very important to remember that the Egyptian uprising against uh, Hosni Mubarak, the so-called bread revolts, for example, precedes the Tunisian revolution. It has its own uh, logic and, and uh, rhetoric. And so did uh, community activism, going back to what Ursula was saying, community activism that did not wait for while when I, they Googled uh, uh, executive to uh, start tweeting and, and so forth to, to cause the revolution. Marwan Bishara, very early, the uh, senior political analyst for Al Jazeera, wrote a fantastic piece documenting that when we were seeing the, the massive uh, gathering of people in Tahrir Square, that these are all community activists doing the groundwork that nobody was, was not on the radar, nobody knew it until uh, handsome. Uh, a Google executive came to television and, and things became uh, public. Uh, so yes, then the, the Egyptian revolution happened and the drama of, uh, of the Egyptian revolution. And one of the slogans of the Egyptian revolution was that uh, addressing the Tunisians, uh, you were uh, the first Antum uh, as you came first and then we joined you. Uh, that is both good but also misleading. N namely, uh, it began to generate an expectation of a, of a domino effect, and as a result, a, theologic, a teleological uh, thing that, okay, Tunisia was first, then Egypt, then uh, uh, Libya, then uh, uh, Yemen, so uh, uh, one after the other. Whereas that, in my reading of these events, uh, generates actually a false uh, a trope and a false uh, 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 pattern. That, uh, in other words, one way that one of the major ideas that I have uh, about this event is that they are not teleological. The other is that we are not witness to uh, what we call total revolution, going after the state. In fact, they are open-ended revolution, and far more uh, important than who will actually take control of the state is the development in society, in the public space. One of the uh, most recent pieces I wrote, for example, in Syria, Syria has become a contested area as to what is happening and has radically split the left. Uh, meaning, as you well know, United States, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf of states are very actively involved in trying to kidnap the revolution or finance it or micromanage it. And that has called suspicion that, uh, that the Syrian revolution is not really a revolution as being manipulated by uh, Saudi Arabia. On the other hand, you have countries like Russia and the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Obviously, they have their best interest in sustaining Hafez al-Assad in uh, Bashar al-Assad in power, not for the love of Bashar al-Assad, but because of their own respective interests. In Libya, 
uh, Russia was left out of the game, and uh, in, in uh, Syria they wished to be part of the, uh, the solution. Now, uh, that, uh, as a result, every, there is an element of stated or unstated statism when it comes to Syria. Who is going to control the state power? Who will, what will happen when uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad falls? Whereas uh, a closer reading of the event shows that it is actually the society formation of voluntary associations, labor unions, women's rights organizations, the student assemblies that are beginning to take shape, uh, teachers, uh, unions, uh, etc. that uh, whoever, whatever the political mach machination might be in the aftermath or even during uh, Bashar al-Assad, the, the issue is not who is going to take state control of the state, but who uh, the people who are supposed to be ruled, going back to Fanon and the question of the, uh, uh, of the uh, re revolution. Now, how are they, uh, how are these revolutions uh, sustained? Is the, uh, uh, first of all, let me say something about the question of how do they start. Obviously, the suicide, the tragic suicide of one food peddler doesn't start a series of revolution. Uh, in my uh, way of thinking about these revolutions, I have, uh, I usually ask three kinds of questions. One, obviously, is economic malaise. What, what are the economic uh, uh, the conditions? Other is equally important social anomie that is uh, uh, generated by not feeling part of the, uh, the society in which uh, you're supposed to be a member. And the third factor is cultural alienation. And cultural alienation did not begin or wait for globalized uh, condition. It has always existed. But it is the combustible combination of these three factors, economic malaise, social anomie, and, and cultural alienation, that come together and create a revolutionary momentum. Now, these are all ex post facto uh, uh, understandings. It is not that if you necessarily uh, sort of manufacture them in a condition, it will uh, result in, uh, uh, in, in a revolution. The other factor I wanted to say is uh, what I call the regenerative web of group affiliation. As you know, uh, uh, the uh, YouTube and uh, uh, Twittering and uh, etc. has been given a lot of credit for uh, these revolutions. I'm neither entirely gung ho on these new uh, uh, social networking, nor am I antiquarian that, that, that not, uh, they don't matter. I very, as a sociologist, I've gone back to uh, Georg Zimmel's web of group affiliation, and I simply consider uh, these new modes of group affiliation, affiliation as an extension of uh, physical, actual web of group affiliation that we have, exacerbates them. If we reduce all group, uh, web of group, group affiliation to this uh, social networking, we lose. If we disregard it entirely, oh no, this is a fad, we will also lose. If we, more balance is to go back to Zimmel, I, I uh, suggest. Now, uh, the thing that I have become fascinated that in fact I was talking to Drusella just before we came, is the question, and also par partially by my understanding of what's happening in the party part that I'm sure Todd will, will talk about, is what exactly is the public space? Where exactly is the space in which we're supposed to have uh, a revolution, or even a gathering to talk about uh, uh, an uprising? The few times that I have been to the Zuccotti Park, uh, my sense is that that notion of the public good or public uh, space is being, uh, uh, we need to re re reconsider. And I will give you two examples uh, in uh, apparently two sides of, uh, of a condition to ask you to think about this new public space. And one is a Palestinian refugee camps as a new space, and one is the so-called tent movement in Israel. You recall that in Tel Aviv, uh, or the, towards the end of the summer, uh, 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 last summer I was teaching a course on the Arab Spring, and I had a bet with my students that before the summer over, the Israelis will join the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, well, in a, in a manner of speaking, as it were. And before the end of the summer, we had a tent uh, uh, uprising. I'm not saying that that a tent uh, uprising in Israel is exactly the, the, the Arab Spring, but the fact, and also depends how you're reading it, 
Uh, Gideon Levy reads it one way, if you read Haaretz, uh, other people may, may read it some other way. Uh, now, I'm asking you to think about the tent, the idea of a tent in the middle of Tel Aviv by any number of group of Israelis uh, sort of revolting against the status quo, and a Palestinian refugee camp as the new sites of the definition of public space in the way that Hart and Negri talk about the common good, that the common now needs to be uh, re redefined. That common space orders a Zakati part. I mean, uh, these are very raw manner of thinking. The Zakati part, Palestinian refugee camps, and the tents in, uh, in Tel Aviv. For us to think about what exactly is the public space, because right, this is a private space. Okay? Another example that recently on my mind, I'm just writing on it, is, uh, is Diego Rivera's uh, exhibition up in Roma. It will cost you, if you don't know, I'm sure you know, $25 to get admitted into MoMA for one adult person. So if you're a couple, it's $50. If you have kids over uh, 16, that's another uh, 16, uh, $25, that comes $100. Now, if you want to buy a book of, uh, uh, that, that MoMA has published, fantastic book, it costs you about 50 bucks. So for a family of four to sell it, it will cost you 150 bucks to go and look at Diego Rivera's public art. I mean, the Diego Rivera is known as the artist of public art. I mean, these things, in fact, if you look at his art, they're so uh, extraordinarily big because they were meant to be in public, not in, in private. So you're a bit too close to uh, uh, the man named Zapata or uh, uh, other works. So I asked the very polite uh, 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 official in MoMA, uh, is there any discount? I teach at Columbia. Is there any discount for me? And I said, no, there is no discount unless you work for a corporation. And I thought about, <laughs> and I thought about President's salary, uh, which is a salary of a CEO, but uh, Todd and I don't get the salary of, uh, of, uh, of a thing. So unless you work for a corporation, you don't get a discount to enter uh, a MoMA. So both aesthetically and uh, and, and $150 for a New Yorker, I mean, think of it. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the poverty line in the United States is 50.33%. Uh, Almost 50 million Americans live under poverty line, according to the Census Bureau 2011 uh, statistics. And there, the, the definition of the, of the poverty line is $24,000 a year, which comes to, I calculated, about $5,000 an adult person per year. Divided by 365 days, I calculated it, that, it, that a, a person has to forego uh, 10 days of, uh, of food and shelter in order to go and see Diego uh, Rivera's public art. Public art privatized in, in, in MoMA. So, going back to the, to the idea of Tahrir Square, you know, the, uh, 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 Egypt, Cairo, Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square, as a result, has now become a metaphor of what exactly is the space, the location from which we launch uh, a political movement. That, to me, is a critical uh, a moment, and here, that everything that follows from public space, I mean, uh, in my writing of my book on the Arab Spring, Han, the figure of Hannah Arendt has been paramount. His, her comparison of the American Revolution and the, and the French Revolution. She preferred to recall the American Revolution because of the public space. This is where, where uh, and what she called the, the social uh, issue, which was the economic factor in the French Revolution, she thought had mis misdirected the French Revolution. She had great admiration for the American Revolution, although her concern was, we're in new school, so we're in the shadow, great shadow of uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that public space has become routinized uh, in, in the American uh, politics. Now, the key to it is that we are facing a presidential election and uh, if the public space is supposed to be the ground zero of the rise of democratic uh, uh, concerns, what does that mean for a country like Egypt or Tunisia or Bahrain or uh, Yemen that 50 years from now they will be privileged to have a new Gingrich to run for, for their presidency? Is that the model that we are thinking about? Uh, 
Or if not, if, as Badiou and others have suggested, in fact, the very idea of democracy is now up for grabs for redefinition or reconsideration, in our domain, in, in places like uh, in North Africa or Middle East, etc., uh, which the subtitle of my book I call it The End of Postcolonialism, meaning the mode of knowledge production conducive in the aftermath of colonialism has ended. It, that is, you look at the figure of uh, Muammar Gaddafi running in, uh, in desert for his life, he was supposed to be a post-colonial officer. You follow? And that's, that's, that's has ended. And all of them are supposed to be post-colonial figures. That means that the leading slogan of the Arab revolution, a sha'ab, you read Iskot in Islam, people demand the overthrow of the regime. The regime is not just the figurehead of Hosni Mubarak or Muammar al-Gaddafi, etc. Because that, in fact, is a paradox. Because the calculus, the, the, the modified calculus that laser beams on Muammar al-Gaddafi or Bashar al-Assad, etc., for, forgets or disregards or could possibly disregard the fact that the calculus of turning the regime around is a far more different issue. And as a result, much of the counter-revolutionary forces, Americans, Saudis, the Gulf <coughs> States, Gulf Cooperation Council, Arab uh, 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 Congress, all of them are geared, in my opinion, to, for a false uh, satisfaction, immediate false satisfaction, with the status quo, the overthrow of the, uh, of the uh, figurehead, the chopping off the, of the head, but keeping the rest of the regime intact, and as a result, the challenge that now these revolutions face in, is in fact overcoming that false satisfaction and going for the kill, and going for the kill is, is uh, where, where the issue is. And the issue remains at the societal level. Here we have a number of issues and works are cut out, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the false binary that has been generated between uh, Islamist and secular that is plaguing the revolutionary movements right now. The right now, uh, uh, the leading revolutionary activists, we just had a delegation from, uh, from Egypt in, uh, in uh, this is the last thing, uh, Tarek al in uh, at Colombia, are concerned what sort of constitution are the Muslim Brotherhood going to write for, for uh, Egypt. My response is, uh, in fact, follows what Drusilla just said, you don't wait and pray for the mercy of Muslim Brotherhood that will write you a constitution that will protect your civil liberties. You begin to organize now, and the three critical spaces, in my opinion, independent labor unions, women's rights organizations, student assemblies, are the way to begin to regenerate civil society in terms of in the form of a voluntary association that will shift the balance away from the state formation, because the state formations will remain subject to manipulations of all sorts, and you need to have a robust society that will resist, bring down the machinery of uh, tyranny, rather than stay at the mercy of it. Thank you. Ahmed, thank you very much. try to dispense with the first question we were asked very briskly. How do movements start? I haven't the faintest idea. Um, every theoretical attempt I've seen to articulate a theory of when and under what circumstances they start is very easily punctured. Um, after the fact, the theorists arrive and explain like mad. Uh, what was at the time inexplicable. I entered college at a time when I was uh, willy-nilly uh, part of what was called at the time the silent generation. Uh, all the articles in all the major magazines articulated the, the notion that we were the silent generation. And yet I remember very clearly the day that I joined a movement. 
I was walking down the street. It was the fall of 1960, early, late September, early October. I just returned to Harvard for my sophomore year. I was walking down the street from Harvard Yard, and I saw a sign on a uh, fixture, uh, and it announced the rally to take place um, a week or two hence. Uh, sponsored by something I'd never heard of called the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. And it uh, had some names on the board that I recognized, Pete Seeger and Joan Baez, bless them. Uh, it's various politicians and uh, whatnot. And I remember thinking to myself, oh yeah, I'm going to go to that thing. Now, I had never done anything like that in my life, nor I'd had any conversations with anybody I knew about doing that. I just, was sort of in the air. Oh yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I discovered, to my amazement, that a lot of people I knew with whom I had friendly relations but had never felt like political activity was any part of it, discovered they were going to. One thing led to another. I'm not here to, to, to narrate my illustrious past. Um, but but I, my point is that suddenly something happens. It's completely unanticipated. Um, I, I just finished a book uh, that's coming out on May Day about the Occupy Wall Street movement. In the course of several months, I interviewed a number of people, including some who were there in Zuccotti Park on September 17th. And I've yet to find anybody who expected this to be any more or less than any of a series of interesting momentary occupations that had taken place in the Wall Street area over a period of months. In fact, there had been a call issued some time before for an occupation uh, in Zakati Park, which had culminated in a grand total of 19 people arriving there, four of them with tents. They decided not to stay. Um, we all know about Rosa Parks, and deservedly so. Rosa Parks who decided to sit in that famous seat in the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and every power to her. However, it was not the first time a black person in the Deep South had sat down in a bus and refused to move, and nor was the Montgomery bus boycott of December 1955 the first bus boycott to erupt in the Deep South. And some of them had actually succeeded in erasing the color line. One of them in Baton Rouge is a fine book by Alden Morris called The Origins of the Civil Rights Movement that traces some of this history. So it was never evident, it was never self-evident that the, that bus boycott would be the bus boycott that would inaugurate uh, this compulsive change in the American caste system. It was never self-evident that uh, any that this occupation of Zuccotti Park would be different from any other, from Bloombergville, which involved a few hundred people last spring, various other kinds of demonstrations going around Wall Street. So what is it we can say about the conditions under which movements matter? And in particular, since I don't believe in general theories, I'm going to talk about the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, as those of you know who've been involved in it in some fashion, or feel yourself to be involved in it, because that's really what counts. There are no membership cards, as you all know. Um, among the many interesting people I've met in this movement is a man named Shen Tong, who is Chinese by origin, um, and has a very interesting history that brought him to the Occupy movement. He was a leader of the movement in Tiananmen Square in 1989. He was a student at the Beijing University. He was a skilled young man. I think he was 19 at the time or so. Uh, ended up in the group that were trying to negotiate between the Tiananmen Square people and the government. Uh, he was uh, down the street when the massacre was committed. He had achieved a visa to come to the United States to study. He was able to smuggle himself out of the country. He came to the U.S. He wrote a memoir of his experience there, which is very much worth reading. Uh, and time passed. He went to school. He accumulated degrees. Uh, he 
went back to China, spent some time in jail at one point, but mostly he devoted himself to the American entrepreneurial spirit and created a software company which put him in an office near, as it turns out, Zuccotti Park. And when the occupation of Zuccotti Park began, he went down to see what this was and he became animated by it. And he threw himself into it. The upshot is that he became a 28-hour-a-day Occupy activist, which he remains. He said something, at a, a, we were at a meeting together a few weeks ago, and he said something uh, remarkable, I thought. He said, you know, um, there are two kinds of crises that afflict the social movement. Uh, I've, I've been through now two. The first is massacre. The second is success. <laughs> Occupy now experiences, fortunately, the second uh, crisis. What, what, it's not naive to speak of a success. And I want to speak a bit, uh, a little bit, um, and explore what we should make of it. First of all, the Occupy movement created it, it performed an act of social invention. It created itself. There is now an Occupy movement. It doesn't require an explanation. I mean, there was much to say about what it is and what it isn't, and what it ought to be, and so on. But it's a phenomenon. It exists. How do I measure that? Just a, you know, a couple things that crossed my, my mind. The, uh, is it yesterday's or today's New York Times? It was yesterday's. The lead story, the front right-hand column of the New York Times, says that the shareholders of Citigroup uh, expressed the desire not to reward their chief executive officer in the manner to which he thought he was entitled. That's the lead article in the New York Times. Now, that obviously is a spin-off of the Occupy phenomenon. But all kinds of other things are as well. I was walking down the street in Chicago in February on the near north side, and I saw a huge billboard, huge, up the side of a tall building. It said, Occupy your bedroom. <laughs> um, and then it, there was some words down the side uh, to the effect that, are you Having, are you being snored out of your own bed? <laughs> and then invited you to go to a website. Which I think the, I think the, uh, I think it was called snoringcenter.com, and which eventually I did go to. And it turns out they're selling equipment for stifling snores. Um, these are two very different kinds of success. But, and obviously one is entitled to feel ambivalent, at least about the second one. But when you have invented a terminology which becomes a part of common sense so that advertisers want to employ it as a gimmick, you have achieved a significant success. That is to say, you have become a social thing. Whatever it is, you be, you're on the map, and that is a success. Um, there's, I want to say one thing about what I think, I mean, I, I, I'm also highly interested in the so-called objective conditions that undergird um, such a phenomenon, but um, there's one that I think, with respect to Occupy, that hasn't gotten nearly uh, the attention it deserves. Because, by the way, Things were really bad in America on September 17th, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010. Nothing happened. Um, something, however, made possible the existence of this movement that was beyond its social inventiveness. I by no means want to minimize its social inventiveness. And this undergirding condition, which I think still obtains, means that this movement has a significance that even it itself may not yet grasp. And it is this. To my knowledge, um, in, among social movements in American history, going back to the early 19th century, and certainly among those for whom we have public opinion polls, which go back to 1935, 
This is the first movement in that span of American history that began with popular support. Now, that may seem like a very odd claim, and but trust me, I won't, I mean, unless somebody's interested, I won't uh, regale you with numbers. But even in the 1930s when the industrial unions were being organized and Americans told the Gallup, Gallup pollsters that they liked the idea of unions. They preferred craft unions to industrial unions. They thought that unions should be licensed by the government. They liked Henry Ford better than they liked John L. Lewis. That was in the glorious 30s. In the early 1960s, in fact, right around the time I was on my way to my first political rally, uh, Americans were asked how they felt about civil rights legislation, and a large majority, a supermajority, thought they had, that America had the civil rights legislation it needed, and that what remained before any further activism was justified was to apply the laws that already existed. This was 40, this was just before the Kennedy-Nixon election. This was four years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. This was five years before the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Americans were content with the way things were. Uh, when the anti-Vietnam War movement began, uh, the war was supported by 60 to 80 percent of Americans. Uh, when the women's movement began, a large majority of Americans uh, did not believe that women were paid less on the job than men and believed that women uh, with young children ought to stay home with them and subject. You're talking about the 20s? Sorry? You're talking about the 20s or the, or the second No, 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 I'm talking about 1969. Okay, the second one. Uh, there were no polls at the time of uh, Elizabeth Cady Um And as for the gay movement, the Stonewall, if you think that Americans were enthusiastic about homosexuality, or you know, same-sex love, they weren't. This movement began, the current movement began with supermajorities expressing their distaste for, uh, for uh, the, uh, what some people have called the cyboxification of American culture, expressing their support, fervent support for progressive taxation, expressing their desire for regulation of banks, and so on. And the, those polls are consistent. So this movement begins with this bedrock of popularity, which in my view uh, permits it, permits us to be thinking about, and with all due apology to you, because this is a word I actually like, I think we may be at an early stage of an awakening. And I think awakening is, a, is one framework within which to think about this. Um, I'll, I'll come back, I'll say it a bit later, uh, what I mean by awakening. But I want, now I'm going to violate my own declaration that I have nothing general to say about social movement, because I do have one general thing to say, which is partly built on my experience in the 1960s, but also very much built on my appraisal of social movements in general. People get very adam get very uh, bitter and and contentious in the middle of social movements, in that in a number of fashions which are fairly predictable, and one of them is a repeated argument, a dispute, more than an argument, a, 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 a quite vigorous uh, dispute about uh, the degree to which a movement ought to express feeling and the degree to which a movement ought to be a strategic mover of history. The, expre the expressive and the strategic are the two poles of social movement existence, social movement identity. And in a way, it's an argument that can never be won. It's like the argument in a battery between the positive and the negative pole. Um, they are fixtures. They are built in. Because movements are both expressive and strategic in different measures at different times. The expressive comes from the fact that what's moving in a social movement is human passion. And human passion wants to express itself. That's how it, that's how it lives. 
And the strategic has to do with a rational, more or less, or at least the aspiration, to a rational appraisal of who the forces are in a society in a, or in a political system, uh, who, uh, uh, which forces can be mobilized, which forces must be stopped, which forces can be neutralized. Such kinds of appraisals have to do with rational thought, what Weber called the, the ethic of responsibility. Uh, an idea about who is mobilizable for what purpose and what kinds of consequences can be expected to follow uh, from acting in certain ways. Um, I, I, um, I also believe that all social movements need, in order to be both expressive and strategic, they need to win victories which demonstrate to people looking at the movement from outside that this is a social force to be reckoned with. And they also need for themselves, looking inside to themselves, a sense of momentum, a sense of their continuing existence and value. So movements need to win victories and they need a sense of momentum. They need, in other words, to be, and this is how I, this is where I think the Occupy movement is now in the throes of trying to figure out whether it can do this or whether it even wants to do this. I think in order to be significant, they need to be full service movements. They need to be movements which have a place for the necessary fanatics at the center and also have a place for people who are otherwise, you might say, occupied, uh, but who, uh, whose support in some fashion or other is required in order for them to win victories. Uh, a full service movement has a place for the people who sleep in tents, and it has a place for people who uh, will sign a petition, or will go on a big march, or will buy a share of a Bank of America stock in order to vote to, dis to break up the bank, which is a project in the works. A full service movement has a place for people who are thinking themselves over, who are challenged morally by the existence of the movement to uh, ask what is required of them. And this is the story, to take the example I know best, of the 1960s that isn't so much told. We know the stories of the drama. We know this, the theatrical stories. We know the photogenic stories. We've seen the collages of moments. What we don't generally understand is that for every one of those moments, there were a hundred other moments where people were talking themselves over, over the kitchen table, asking themselves what the civil rights movement required of them, what the anti-war movement of them. Women were asking themselves, what do I do in my marriage about my kids and so on. Uh, gay people were trying to decide whether to come out of the closet. That sort of subterranean movement was equally important. Um, the, I, I want to just say something very briefly about the creative acts that I think are required now. What I, what I, what I want to center on, and the reason why I like the term awakening, is that it refers to a sense of moral necessity. I know that it's not fashionable to take the idea of morality seriously, uh, at least outside the academy. It's considered soft-headed. It seems to me that the Occupy movement is a profoundly moral movement. And in fact, that is its very deep strength. It's because what it, what it says is, not only am I angry that I've been dispossessed, not only am I indignant about the way I've been treated by this bank or this corporation and so on, but also says it is shameful, it is a disgrace, it's appalling that the banks did what they did, wrecked the world economy, and have done so with impunity. That this is a moral scandal. And to me, it's this, it's this moral conviction that can enable the movement to do something very difficult now, which is to be both an outside movement, a social movement, a movement of horizontalist identity, if you will, 
and also a movement that has a part to play in the inside politics of our time, which in our system, we might want to get into this argument, I think is unavoidably, or unavoidably partakes of the politics of political parties. Um, it does not behoove us to deplore the, in my view, it does not behoove us collectively, or, or the, the Occupy movement collectively, to deplore the appalling Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court, and at the same time to remove from its knowledge the knowledge that those judges who got there to do that were appointed by a political party. And the successors to those judges will be appointed as a result of political elections. One thing you have to do when you're a social movement is get up in the morning and comb your hair. What I mean is, one thing you have to do when you're a social movement is protect yourself. And if you think the Republican Party is going to do, is going to, is going to work toward your protection as a social movement, as well as the Democratic Party, I'd like to have a discussion with you in some detail about why that isn't the case. Uh, so, a moral movement, an awakening movement, is not a clean-handed movement. There are no, if you want clean hands, stay home. You won't find clean hands in politics. Because it doesn't go to heaven. That's not what we're about. The politics on earth is a politics that gets dirty. So, um, I, I, I brought some, uh, some propaganda flyers here that tell you you should read my book if you want to know more about why I think these things. Um, I'd be very happy if you did that. Um, but I think I'll, I'll desist at this point and I'll say my piece. Thank you, Todd. I'm going to give the speakers a chance to comment and ask questions of one another. While you all think up your questions, the speakers have generously left us plenty of time for Q&A, so that puts a responsibility on the audience to participate in the discussion. So is there any of you that would like to comment on anything that you've... Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Todd a question. Um, you know, the Socialist Party of the United States had great success in the the 20s in local elections, uh, and uh, you know, even inspired Edgar Hoover's you know terror of um, socialism. I agree with you that we, you know, there's no clean hands. The, the Republicans will uh, pass right to work laws. Uh, they will, um, you know, ban demonstrations, and I mean, they'll come up with every creative way they can and that the example of South Africa shows an environment of entitlement, um, at least, you know, but the government sends the police out and the police don't join in because it's confused. Well, I was very struck by that Yes, yeah, you know, it's confused. I mean, the state doesn't, you know, wants to smash this, but it can't smash it. The Democratic Party, in a much lesser way, has some of that, so I'm with you. But are you completely convinced that we don't need a third party? I, I will get your book, by the way. <laughs> um, I need a third hand. I could really use a third hand. I can't have it. We have a rigged political system because of our Constitution. Um, in, in parliamentary systems, there is a hard and fast payoff for being a third or fourth or eighth political party and losing. Absolutely. Because if you get 5% of the vote, you get, and in Germany, I mean, it varies from country yeah, to country, right. you get representation in parliament, which means that you, you, get, you get public support for your political activities. And that's extremely valuable. So that people can do politics uh, of all kinds, you know, and they matter. Those parties matter. They, 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 uh, you know, sometimes they get elected to office and they can actually accomplish things. 
Um, and that looks good to people who are not convinced, yeah, especially. Local yeah. yeah, local states elections and the Milan elections in Germany, for example. So that politics then cease, ceases to be uh, a, an airy, rarefied habit for people who like you know, going to political rallies. It becomes you know, a practical activity that people can simply say, oh yeah, we can win. We can actually get these, you know, these, the things you described. You know, I mean, if people could get them in some other way, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. But we have a rigged system. I don't see any way to undercut that. I really don't. And, you know, I have to say that I think, you know, there would be a lot of people alive in the world today had it not been for, uh, I know I'm going to make a lot of friends here, Ralph Nader's arguments about the necessity of a third party, which was in effect him, in the year 2000. I think the case is closed. There's only one case in American history, only one case in American history, of a fringe party becoming a major party. And that was the Republican Party. And it happened in 1854. Um, and it happened because there was one overriding issue that was about to tear the country apart, and it was obviously the issue of slavery. And the Republican Party arrived at the moment when the other major party, what had been the second party, was in complete rupture as a result of the issue of slavery. And it then quickly disappeared, the Whig Party. That's the only time a third party has become a second or first party. It's not because Americans are, you know, are stupider than other people, or you know, sometimes wonders. It's not because Americans are even necessarily less attentive to politics than, uh, than people else. It's because the sy its system is structurally rigged. Now, um, this is not to say that I think we should prostrate ourselves and worship the American Constitution. In fact, I think it might well be that one focus of attention over the next period of time would be actually to campaign uh, for a, a constitutional amendment for complete public financing of elections, to, to rip money out of politics, because everything is stuck, stalled, paralyzed by the hold that money has on politics. But I think going after the party system, starting from scratch, you just don't get anywhere. So for me, it's, pre it's strictly pragmatic. Thank you. I'm going yeah, to follow on your seller's point as to uh, the part. Uh, because the worst case scenario reading you is, yes, this was this social invention called Occupy Wall Street, but let's go back to two-party system business as usual. I wonder, Todd, if the two wonderful examples you gave, driving and that sign, Occupy, uh, your bedroom uh, concerns you that this social invention has become commodified and now sells. And uh, uh, either a column in New York Times or the uh, you know, uh, chief executive officer is not going to get you know, this or commodification on, on that, or the fear, legitimate fear, that uh, uh, political parties have uh, appoint judges, judges uh, decide our future, the future of our children, uh, and so forth. The, the question that I have is, is not giving a metaphor that you wish you had a third hand. If I were to convince you, Drusella and uh, Tara of something or another, we, we will have eight hands. <laughs> That's the revolutionary Gemeinschaft mm -hmm. condition that now we have with uh, Occupy Wall Street. Now, the question to me is not reduced to, oh, historically, we have never had a third political party that, that succeeds. The question is, I ask myself, what is Gingrich and Centurum doing to remain in the race when they don't have a snowball chance in hell to become the Republican uh, nominee, except pushing Mitney more and more to the right, right? Which means pushing Obama more to the right. 
Uh, well, I mean, if they, if, if they are defining the space, then they are defining the space in those terms. So not voting or publicizing uh, or, or radicalizing the Occupy Wall Street doesn't mean necessarily to just stop the, or dismantle the political system or be idealist or be uh, anything of that sort. But to posit a public space, a public discourse that pulls the political discourse back to, towards the left in whatever creative way possible, and not sort of yielding uh, the, the floor, as it were, for the right to pull it back and back into business as usual. Oh, OK, and occupy your bedroom. Now you had your, uh, your, your thing. So let, let's go back business as usual. Well, what you, the scenario you described has happened. The, the existence of the Occupy movement has pulled the political discourse to the left. That was not its intention. It could care less. I mean, when it began, it, it, if we could speak of it as an it, for the most part, it could care less about the political system. But the political system was, because there is no principle in the political system, or very little, uh, it was uh, what political parties do. It was opportunism, and, and, and opportunism is the name of the game. Um, I'm not afraid of commodification. Um, I think that the whole fear, and I was, you know, from the very beginning, there, were, there was an intense dispute in the Occupy movement about co-optation. It was the bugaboo word. I mean, it was already cropping up, you know, before anybody had ever heard of it. Um, there, was, there was this terror of co-optation. I mean, when Miley Cyrus, uh, did or her people did a remix of, of some song on her new album, and they sort of they they redid it to a, as with an as a sort of anthem to Occupy with all kinds of you can see it on YouTube you know, that's seven million viewers or something and, you know which had a lot of pictures of Arab Spring and this and that and everybody was occupying I forget the name of her song but it was also a song and some you know some people were you know quite aghast. And I thought it was terrific. I thought it's fantastic. It's a pop star who, who recognizes there's something afoot, and she wants to exploit it. More power to her. By the way, one of the very shrewd PR people in Occupy publicly said, um, if Miss Cyrus is serious, she should go down and um, uh, and uh, she should go down to Occupy LA and join them. But the same person told me when she, when she said she understood that actually Miley Cyrus wanted to do that. And her people, uh, hovering over her, thought that was ill-advised Ill career move and stopped it. I think, fine, people want to jump on this bandwagon. It means that the bandwagon exists. And you know, this is not new. This is not new. In, you know, in, the, in the 1960s, there was the Dodge Revolution. I remember it was quite, came quite early, 19, around 65. The Dodge Revolution. CBS Records ran ads in all the underground papers with a kind of shaggy looking guy with a beard and a woman with a long hair and I think a black guy or something. And their slogan was, the man can't bust our music. And that was, by the way, that those ads were <coughs> significant financial supports for the underground press, which is one reason why the FBI got busy and, and put an end to it, okay? I, you know, Martin Luther King was, was already an image while he was still alive, and he was extremely acutely and quite deftly aware that it was, you know, it was a move in an elaborate political game of becoming a, you know, becoming the, what what Gramsci would call the common sense of this, sort of creating again not his language, but Gramsci's a hegemonic block that corrals Pope. It joins and corrals common sense. Fine, you know, bring them on, I say. I'm not afraid of it. And I, I think the movements, you know, just one of the, I'm sorry I'm rattling on here, but just one other thing. I, mean, I think there's a fundamental analytical error in this. I think the fear of co-optation is predicated on a belief that we are weak. And they, with their apparatus, with their money, with their party, with their PR, with their advertising, and so on, they will swamp us. I don't think that's true. I think this movement is very strong, and its potential is yet unrealized. So I'm not afraid of it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I want to um, push this question a little bit um, because you know I uh, had 
you know, was involved in the union movement as a, a paid union organizer and also as an on-the-ground organizer. I was in Marxist-Leninist groups. I was in a group that did armed self-defense for the Black Panthers. So this issue of party organization is one that I've been struggling with for a long time. But also, um, at, at the question of, of co-optation became one that in very practical circumstances, Todd, I dealt with when I moved into being a paid union organizer. I'll give you an example of it. And I mean, so I think that it's not always just about strengths and weaknesses. It's really about having some idea of what you stand for, you know, and, and where you're not going to fill out. And so I was um, fired from Columbia University. I was the first unfair labor practice. I was a phone operator supporting my husband through graduate school. Um, had it been partially, but uh, maybe, gosh, maybe I could go to graduate school, but I came went much, much, much later. So um, I was you know, fired and um, sued Columbia was reinstated after I'd become a law professor. It took 14 years to get reinstated. Maybe unwisely stayed as a law professor. Now, um, but I decided not to go back to my, yeah, good morning, Columbia, um, job that I had for so many years. Um, now, the, the reason that I had a view of what a union was, of what it meant to be in union and solidarity, it became informed by feminism, and that meant for me, for example, in terms of your moral stance in, in politics, that I could never lie to the women. So there's a big insurance stretch. I get fired from Columbia, it's done first time for labor practice, District 65 gives me a job. First job I ever have where I'm paid by the union, yeah, very little. Um, and there's a big insurance strike around maternity leave. And I'm told, because I, you know, I was very much on the ground with the people, you know, mobilizing with the masses of women, and that's the way we did things in feminism. Um, we don't stand aside as the union from outside. We are in union. Now, they, the union tells me to go lie to them and say that we, they can't afford the strike anymore. So tell them they won maternity leave, but they didn't win maternity leave. Now, see, that was a moment for me of concrete co-optation. Either I'm going to go and lie, and I supported my husband through graduate school at the time, so now he didn't want me to get fired. I, my mother said I managed to get fired from everything, so I had to avoid it in my head. Um, but I was told I had to lie. So I, I went against what I saw as the movement of unionism being about. So I went up and I said to the women, the union can't afford to pay you strike pay anymore, and you haven't won maternity leave, and I think we should have a democratic meeting here. And I was promptly fired by David Livingston. The women marched to the Union Hall and picketed at the Union Hall saying we have to hire Drusilla back because she will never sell us out. Now, this is one of the proudest moments of my life, never sell us out, right, because I'm going to stick by my principles of unionism. Isn't there another constant, complex negotiation that you have to make of, this, of a strategic sort just when you become successful that you don't sell out. All I mean, I had, the, you know, I had my job on the line. Like I said, it wasn't a job I could easily lose. I, mean, I was unemployed for a couple of weeks while the union refused to hire me back and all the rest of it. But it was because I had a view of principled unionism, to use another you know, you know, left words at that time, and unprincipled unionism. And I stood by what I saw principled unionism. Um, I see in Wall, um, I, I Wall Street, I'm going to take back the future of my feminist group, we're in a lot of these work groups, that there has to be some notion of principled stance versus unprincipled. And that's part, you know, I, I mean, I agree with you, you can't be like, are they going to co-opt us, you know, every time a, a movie star or an academic, you know, speaks. But uh, when I was asked to speak as an academic, I said I wouldn't do it. When I was asked to speak as a former union organizer, I said, okay. In part, because I didn't really think I had anything to say as the movement began as an academic on Occupy Wall Street. Uh, you know, so, but as a union organizer, I had something to say about the way they were dealing with the police and the way they were dealing with the unions, because I thought they were screwing up pretty badly in the way they were dealing with some of the unions. So maybe we do have to keep some principle versus unprincipled. Uh, always. Boys. I mean, and, and I think this is the heart of this movement. And and I'm not, by the in the slightest, suggestion that this movement dissolve itself into the Democratic Party. Nobody, I, I I haven't heard anybody say that. I mean, but what what I'm 
I mean, to talk about a very recent controversy, there's some people in the Occupy movement who are, got really upset because a coalition of groups calling itself the 99 Spring announced, which includes um, a bunch of unions and a bunch of you know liberal groups and a bunch of environmental groups and move on and I forget who, you know, et cetera, announced that they uh, were taking it upon themselves to train, they hoped, 100,000 organizers this month, this month to alone, in nonviolent tactics. And some people said, this is a White House plot. What was the proof that it was a White House plot? Because Move On supports the Democratic Party. Well, you know, Move On is a Democratic organization of six million people. And yes, it has supported Democratic politics, as, by the way, many millions of Americans do. I don't consider it a sellout to welcome a bunch of organizations that uh, can actually mobilize people, that actually, they, they may very well have trained 100,000 people this month. What a gift. Uh, I mean, that's a gift horse. I don't look it in the mouth. And, but, but what I really want to say is, I don't want it to be the Democratic Party. I think it needs to be an independent force. But an independent force needs to last, and it needs to do some of the things that I mentioned, which are not different at all from what your people in South Africa want. They want victories. They want actually to be a public thing. I, it needs to be an independent movement. But it needs to be an independent movement that's smart and that does an appraisal of you know who, which, who's in the society, who are the forces that we can win, who are the forces that we can lose. If you can split the police, hallelujah. The audience. I'm going to take three questions and then come back to the panel. Who would like to start us off? Go for it. Uh, okay. Um, I have several things. Um, the first is. Be quick. Okay, I'll, I'll do the really quick. Okay. First is that I don't think Anna needs a good explanation for the protests. In fact, all the Morris pointed out that organization was really essential, and you talked about all of the community groups that were involved in organizing for years. Uh, second, I think that there is a theory you have, at least um, the Chinese leader of, you know, Occupy has proposed a really good theory, I think. Massacres and victories or, or successes, and you certainly see that in the Arab Spring. You know, in Tunisia, the police massacre in Kasserine sparks the moral outrage, and the success then convinces the Egyptians they can do it too. And Finally, movements and parties. I, uh, I love the story in South Africa. Reminds me of the relationship shantytown dwellers used to have with Chilean um, left-wing parties. And when you can have that kind of um, synthesis in which one is mobilizing, one is passing laws, it's really wonderful. Um, I think it's tough in the US without a, a left-wing political party. But you know, I had the opposite impression about Egypt because I heard this parade of Egyptians coming through the universities and they said, we don't need to organize for the elections because we're going to hold them accountable in the square. And they did need to organize for the elections. They really needed that as well. Thank you. Next. Um, one element that's missing from this discussion is the rolling influence of the media because outside of the US, the protesters are watching themselves on CNN. But here, well, we have a different uh, perspective on uh, from the media. So, over here. Yes, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Dabashi. You mentioned uh, Israel, the protests, the Zed movement, and also the Palestinian Republic Camp. And I was wondering if you could expand on that as a new possibility to the Palestinians, or what you meant with that Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hamid, would you like to start? Yeah. Uh, I propose social enemy, you're of course absolutely correct. Revolutions are exactly the opposite of social enemy. I, meant, I, I mentioned it along the same lines of economic malaise, social enemy, cultural alienation, as the conditions that in response to which you will have the revolution in the Gemeinschaft that comes uh, forward. Uh, and then beyond that, the moment of revolutionary euphoria that uh, they don't last, uh, as Todd just said, uh, so they need to be institutionalized. And again, I also agree that
that there was this thing that Tahrir Square would last forever, or Tahrir Square will not last forever, uh, and the revolutionary, uh, as nonviolent revolutionary uprisings, one has to make a distinction between violence and uh, force. That force, raw force, that is in Tahrir Square or Manama Square, I mean, if you compare Bahrain and uh, in Egypt, Egypt is far more advanced. The, the, the Tahrir Square uh, euphoria now needs to be institutionalized along the lines that I, that I proposed, labor unions uh, principle, of course. But in, in Manama, in, in Bahrain, you don't, you, you don't, that has not resulted. In fact, it destroyed the, uh, the Pearl Square precisely because that was becoming the, uh, the location. Uh, the, I didn't get the question about the media, but uh, uh, if, I, if I understood it uh, properly, the, 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 the new media, as I said, I don't fetishize it, nor do I dismiss it entirely. The new media is a critical factor in social mobilization, but only as the extension of the uh, Weber group affiliation, the classical Zimelian uh, uh, conception. And uh, it, ha it has many liberating uh, aspects. I mean, we get up in the morning, I don't even leave the bed, and I'm reading Al-Ahram, and I'm reading Al Jazeera, and CNN, etc. So all is good. The question is what you do. Or, I mean, you, uh, the tendency and the danger of this, that you become a couch potato, that you think, and this, uh, this uh, uh, Facebook activism, uh, saccharine. I mean, I know people who work for a, in Chicago for a very lucrative uh, law firm, OK, and live in uh, high, you know, uh, very expensive uh, apartments, but they remember in their 20s and 30s that they were left. So 15 minutes just before they, uh, they hitch for the uh, sushi bar, they sit at their uh, thing and denounce everything that is happening in the Arab Square, or with all the American and the Saudis and uh, this and, uh, and that, and that's the end of their activism. Uh, I was thinking more about the mass media, because the protesters out in Egypt, uh, uh, they're watching themselves on uh, Al Jazeera or CNN, but yeah. over here, our protesters are not watching, not, don't see themselves on... It's different. It, it, I, I offer you two examples. You're absolutely correct in the case of Al Jazeera. We know for a fact that uh, the Egyptian revolutionaries were watching themselves on, on huge screens in Tahrir Square through Al Jazeera and calling Al, Al Jazeera, please don't switch off your, uh, your cameras. But if you were to compare it with Iran, which is a, the Persian is speaking and is not part of the Arab world, and as a result, Al Jazeera, it doesn't have that significance. It has a different semiotics. That is, the kids out in the streets participating in demonstrations <coughs> were shooting 30 seconds, uh, 90 seconds, uh, 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 and then downloading again on uh, YouTube. And the constellation of that created an awareness. The same, in fact, was with Wall Street. And in fact, with some police brutality in Chicago, I remember that this thing uh, uh, created an alternative mode of, mode of uh, information. Now, apropos what I suggested about the intent in Israel uh, uprising in summer and, uh, and the Palestinian refugee camp, there is a, there is a group of uh, uh, architects who are now working on, uh, on the reconceptualization of Palestinian refugee camps. In fact, at uh, CUNY, right now, there is an exhibition in the, in the ground floor of the uh, CUNY uh, in uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, and they are thinking this is entirely against the notion of camp, uh, 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 the notion of camp, and the sort of the stripping of our, uh, our, our, our social character from the, from the Dios into Zoe is a re, I mean, it's very much on the model of the shanty houses, that in fact you take the condition of uh, refugee camps or camps in general and you redefine it in revolutionary and empowering ways. The reason that I was, uh, I'm constantly thinking of conceptual categories that crosses over Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, ideological and psychological bifurcation. Uh, and in fact, the book, my book on Arab Spring ends with a statement by a group of Israeli uh, of uh, Sephardic origin who have written a fantastic letter in support of the Arab uh, revolutions. And to me, however brief, however multiple causes and uh, condition, uh, 
uh, the tent event, the tent uprising in Tel Aviv. The, the very idea of tent, that you leave, I mean, initially was because of shortages of, of, of houses, and then Netanyahu tried to incorporate it into, okay, no, we, we will have more occupied uh, territory in order, to, uh, in order to accommodate it. To, to me, gives an opportunity of a cross-ideological, cross-psychological, a uh, reconceptualization of the space for solidarity and revolutionary uprising. And if we can do it there, with this 60 plus years of animosity, hatred, and bifurcation, I think uh, the, the hope for, for the entire region is far. Uh, Thank you. Just a couple of words about media. Um, yesterday in Brooklyn, um, an Occupy group that's been focused on housing disrupted a foreclosure auction. There were 35 people arrested. You won't find any report of that in any of the established media. I had to go looking to find out about it. I learned about it through a Twitter tweet, actually. Um, uh, there were 100 some odd people decked out on April 17th to make statements about corporate tax evasion and so on. They were there. They Some of them were very colorfully presented in, in the style that Occupy is so good at. Um, no coverage at all. That didn't happen. Um, but there's this is an endless frustration. It's not, even in our time of distrust of media and the profusion of new media, it still matters to be uh, to become a center of attention in the established media. And so you can't just sit around grousing about it. You have to be inventive. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking forward to in the next month is that the, uh, uh, there's a movement to uh, take part in the Bank of America shareholder meeting. It's going to take place on May 9th in Charlotte. Um, and there are more than a thousand people who've already signed up to be there, and that was as of a week ago. Um, and I assume somebody, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the inventiveness, which means, you know, maybe you don't do tents again. Maybe tents have been done. Maybe you have to do something else. And there are a lot of very creative people in this movement, and I look forward to see what they come up with in Charlotte. So you, you always, there. They, they, the media are very bored, easily bored, lazy, um, you know, stupid about novelty. They're looking for the last year's novelty, and it's an interesting, complicated game to try to find the next step which can rivet their their fickle attention. But it's an, it, but it's a game that has to be played you see, because you can't afford. You say, well, of course, it's the bourgeois press. They're doing what they do. Yeah, they're doing always what they do. Uh, and you have to be smarter. Um, I, I just I think, want to say two things. Um, I am not completely convinced that there are ex post facto explanations. Uh, movements don't share something in common, which is really hard work. And I, I think this is the point that you made. Um, you know, I remember now, and let me give another concrete example, because I, I think you're right, that's the way people can relate to certain lessons that people have been activists all their lives, like you and myself, all three of us actually, uh, is that in my first union drive, we started the union drive around health and safety issues. We brought in OSHA, which used to have this organization that went to factories and you made complaints about health. We don't have it really anymore. It's been done in uh, by years of uh, Republican anti-unionism. But we did, um, we've been organizing for a year. Um, I was fired and Pam Bell was fired and uh, the women went out on a wildcat stripe. Now, uh, the, um, and the, the, the company called the police in and um, Pam Bell told me to climb out the window and go tell uh, uh, the, the second plant, uh, which we call Plant B, and um, I said, how is she going to defend herself against the police? And she came up with something very creative, which was all over the Palo Alto media. She decided that the way to defend herself against the police, while I ran over to get Plant B, 
was to go to the Caltex dispenser and start um, <laughs> getting feminism, right? Um, you use the now, now that was the also the medical statement. The abduction of female body becomes a political weapon. Um, that there's no way they're going to go ahead to that bathroom against the stream of bloody cortex, and they didn't. <laughs> and, um, uh, they talked about creative, and boy, did Palo Alto have something to say about it. These women, they're not only, you know, militant communists, they're insane. They're <laughs> <laughs> cortex and complete. It worked like a trunk. Now, we didn't expect the wildcat strike, but once the strike happened, we used it to expedite the union election. So there's always some story of hard work. Now, I'm not saying that maybe that is true of Occupy, because I'm not sure, you know, I read your book, you know more about it than I am. There's some story of hard work and organization in many of these movements. The unions, for instance, in Egypt, it went out the general strike. Um, so I think we might want to say, well, without that hard work and organization, even if it's an ex post, of, uh, ex post facto explanation of how it began, it's at least part of the story of how it sustains itself. Now, there, in other words, if Pam Bell and I were seen as, you know, integral to the union drive, which had seen as winning victories, and so if you have to act. So I guess that's where I think that there's some role of ex explaining what causes combustions like a, a, a general Can I just add something about hard work? Really Gary, quickly. Gary. Okay. There was a movement in 2008 on the campuses, and it was the Obama movement. And a lot of it was motivated by a, a, a strong desire for a radical change. And the belief of a lot of the people threw themselves into that was that if they elected the man, he would walk on water and save us. And in the meantime, we, the members of this movement, would go back to business, would go back to ordinary life. And they did. And look what happened. I mean, and this is neither this is neither to exalt nor to condemn Obama. Obama was doing something else. He didn't really wasn't interested in the outside game. And the students, but I'm here I'm leveling a charge at kind of casual relation to politics. They thought nothing more was required of them. And then they woke up a couple years later and said, Well, that's that didn't work. Okay, we're not living in, in glory now. They didn't turn out to vote in the 2010 elections. We got the Republican House, and look where we are now. So yes, I mean, I'm completely with you. People have to understand that you don't do this for a season. You don't do this for a month. You don't do this for a campaign. You're in it. For Next round of questions. Yes. Um, I have a series of questions. I think I can best articulate to Professor Bashi, but I think this is very relevant to Professor Gidlin. Speak, speak up just a bit. Sure. Um, how would you tie the movement of the Arab Spring into the past, and how important do you think it is to look to the past to understand where the movement is going now? Because do you, would you say there's a connection to the so-called Green Revolution of 09 in Iran, or the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon in 06, or even further back into you know, the 70s, uh, et cetera? And for Professor Gitlin and Cornell, how do you tie like, the Occupy movement um, back to earlier students for instance, SDS um, for Cornell, uh, Professor Cornell now, or the earlier like uh, organi uh, organizing movements of the 60s and the 70s. And sort of a sub-question to that, why do you think there is no left-wing militancy anymore like there was with the Sindhi's liberation front and with um, uh, the Weather Underground or RAF in Germany? Why do you think that movement has gone away? OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, okay, hold on just a second. I'm going to stick my question in. I was struck by um, Drusilla's mention of um, bringing the police over. And I wondered whether uh, Hamid wanted to discuss this, whether that might be possible uh, in the Arab Spring with the military or police, or say something specific, specifically about Egypt. I'm, I'm thinking because about the conscript army. And, and what, oh, sorry, I didn't get it. What is it? Whether, that, whether there's a possibility of breaking away the military from the regime okay. and bringing them over to the, to the movement, what are some of the issues about that? And, and Todd, I wonder whether you might reflect on whether um, Iraq and Afghan veterans are organizable, organizable moving forward for Occupy movement and for left struggle from, in the United States. Um, did you want to add a question? Yeah. 
I mean, we're poised, we're poised um, at the point when the least informed of our of our fellow citizens politically are going to be the most active, that is, in the presidential election. And so I, I wonder if you care to comment on, on whether the, the success of the meme, the Occupy meme, which I think you, that's what you were describing, um, er, can, uh, will have any uh, effectiveness with these, with these undecided and less, less informed. And secondly, if you really do have to wonder what, uh, what the proper political action here is. I mean, it's, it's a huge question. We don't have a third party. And yet, there's going to be some kind of Occupy Spring. I mean, I have the, the ad busters here that calls everyone to, to attention. And um, yes, obviously, Obama has reacted. Uh, the Republicans try to frame this as a, as, as, a, as a mob reaction. So there's a war over how to, how to see it. And certainly, we've had, there's been a lot of success. But now, this, this massive group of uninformed are about to enter the political arena as they do. They wake up every four years. And, and uh, any predictions, any, any, any advice? And, and, and again, we're about to see the, the, the reemergence of the activity of this, these groups who do not want a leader and who do not want to, to put forth a political program, I might add, although they might change. And, and perhaps the Mulan group is doing this because they don't want to be co opted. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give each of the speakers three minutes to wrap this up. I'm sorry if we're running three. Three, three minutes. Yeah. And I'm going to go in reverse order and start with Todd, then uh, Hammond, and then Drusilla. Um, the Weather Underground consisted of about 100 individuals who, having wrecked a mass organization, um, proceeded to uh, paralyze uh, the left. Um, the uh, consequences we're still dealing with. The Symbionese Limited Liberation Army was not a movement, it was a gang of about half dozen crazies uh, who got a lot of attention and left nothing, zero, negative. Um, those were not radical movements, those were the sort of after sputters of radical movements. Um, Nonviolence, which I, deserves a whole lot more treatment, is actually at the core of the moral identity of the Occupy movement, and is one reason why I remain optimistic about it. Um, I don't think it should have a common approach to the elections, but I do think that there will emerge, and there is in the process of emerging, other groups like the 99 Spring, uh, who will put forward programmatic demands and work on them, whether it has to do with driving money out of politics or passing various pieces of legislation. I mean, I think that's one face that the movement ought, ought to have, and I think it will have. And the veterans, I think, are really interesting. You know, um, the, the uh, Scott Olson, is that his name? The young man who was uh, almost killed in Oakland by the, by the, uh, tier, by the yeah. Pepsi canister. Or so on. I mean, he's not alone. I mean, I've met Vietnam vets in in Zuccotti Park, and they're you know they're some of them, by the way, overlap with homeless people because so that's how it is. And I, I think that they are. Uh, I mean, the the, the 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 veterans organizations I think are crucial in this, and and have already uh, you know come forward. So uh, yeah. Okay, uh, apropos the historical roots of the uh, Arab Spring, theoretically, uh, uh, I, again, I fall somewhere in, in the middle. I believe we need to pay attention <coughs> to history, but not to the point of being historicist, that everything is, has, a, has a historical roots. The two examples that you gave, the Green Movement and the Cedar Movement, uh, I think that the uh, Green Movement in Iran had more to do with the Arab Spring, not that caused it, but the demographic disposition of Iran, 80% uh, under the age of uh, 40, 50% under the age of 25, is identical with the demographic disposition of the Arab world from Morocco uh, to Oman. Uh, it is for that demography, that demographical uh, similarity, 
that uh, I think uh, we're witness to a common phenomenon from uh, Central Asia all the way to, the, to North Africa. It's a less so Syrian revolution in Lebanon because it has more, as you well know, more to do with the internal sectarian issues of Saad Hariri and uh, the, uh, Hezbollah, uh, etc. So it, it doesn't have, and it's also a small country, doesn't have the resonances of, uh, of the rest of the Arab world. But theoretically, I fall somewhere in between. I, yes, we need, need uh, to know something about history, but not to the point of assimilating what we are witnessing backward into the historical thing, uh, a condition, because the quantitative changes that we are uh, witnessing has, over the past year and a half, resulted in a qualitative change in the, uh, the what I call the political DNA of the uh, system, of the region. Now, the military in Egypt, uh, uh, as you know, uh, is, uh, as we saw it in the course of the revolution, it, it is uh, the lieutenant down and the lieutenant up. The upper echelon of the Egyptian army is very much incorporated into the American uh, aid and the American military operation and the American regional interest. Uh, and when we saw that they were not going to shoot, it was really the soldiers up that they were not going to do shoot, but the, the operation on will not. Now, but you raise an important question that w where the synergy of the military uh, is. Right now, the fear is that the military interest plus the new liberalism of the Muslim Brotherhood guard into Islamism, oh, okay, now we're all Muslims, let's, uh, le let's do that, may result in a massive counter-revolutionary force that would rub the Egyptian uh, thing. And the fear is, going back to the, to the question of, oh, Tahrir, Tahrir, no, that unless and until Tahrir begins to be translated into specific uh, uh, sites of resistance, we will not have a Tahrir. People will get tired and, uh, and, and go uh, home. Uh, so the, it, it, it remains, at this stage, a wild card. The, the odds are, but what is good, what is advantageous, is the transnational disposition of the Arab revolutions, that they try to contribute, contain it in Tunisia, pops up in Bahrain. Try to uh, sort of do something in, uh, in Yemen, it, it pops up in Syria. Try to control it in Syria, something happens in, in, in Morocco. That, and uh, I'm very ambivalent even about the, the term Arab Spring, because there are many things, as you know, sub-Saharan Africa happens from Senegal to Djibouti to, uh, uh, to Zimbabwe that are identical. Demonstrations, self-emulation, etc. but we don't get it because of the, the Arab Spring. Uh, but at the same time, the fact that we have this wide spectrum of North Africa into Central Asia, speaking uh, Arabic and having resonances, one uh, slogan across the Arab world, people demand the overthrow of the regime is a good thing. Finally, if I may just say one word about this and informed, I don't believe revolution or uprisings are caused by one group of activists. There are deep-rooted structural causes for the, in my opinion, uh, rise of the Occupy Wall Street. And whatever may happen to the leading echelon or the, the major activists of the Occupy Wall Street, because the structural uh, uh, issues remain, it will pop up in some uh, other way, and I wouldn't call them uninformed. They're, they're, that is, the, the course of the uh, uprising teaches them things that I think we also yeah. need to comment. Thank you. Just so last one. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, just say three things. The first is, is I, I think we do need to have theory. Um, one of my favorite quotes from a play is, I may be dead, I may not know who I am, but I'll always be a socialist. Me too. And, uh, that means we need an analysis of capitalism, and I can't say the word enough. Overthrow capitalism. Now, then we'll start constituting a revolutionary government. Now, now that's what I'm teaching a whole class on, and there have been thinkers who have thought very profoundly about that. Rosa Luxemburg, one of my favorite, Emma Goldman, and one other. One of my favorites, and it's not just girls. I even include V.I. Lennon. Of course, girls are my favorite revolutionary. There's many guys who are struggle, and I appreciate them. Um, that the, the second thing is, I think there's a danger in the United States of being scared of theory, and that's part of what I was trying to say in the union story. I was a Kantian Hegelian 
Adorian feminist, Emma Goldman, Luxembourgian Marxist, and yeah, it was confused then. It's confused now. But I still try to work with it. Um, and I think that there needs to be some understanding that if we have capitalism, that's why I love the shanty dwellers. I mean, everybody's a communist. You know, I mean, the, the left and right wing communist. You know, I mean, but the idea that you can have a humane society and capitalism never occurs to this movement. And the sellout at the ANC is it's not live up to the freedom chart of a socialist program, and they're all socialists, you know. So maybe we don't know what socialism is, and that we're going to have to figure out, and that's going to be a theory. Now, related to that is something that I think we oftentimes don't talk about in the academy, which I worry about all the time. I've been an activist all my life. Now, I've got fired a lot. I haven't been fired recently. It's <laughs> uh, am I getting old and selling out? Because I know that there's going to be a lot of young people in this job market who are getting PhDs, say, at the New School or at Rutgers, where I teach, who will take knots, who will be blacklisted, who will not get jobs. And so I think that one of the things that we've had to face in terms of um, people who have been lifelong activists is that um, you may really suffer. You may get thrown out of the mainstream. Um, and perhaps that that's something that needs to be put on the agenda um, and understood in Occupy. That that's the hard work. That's the commitment to the long haul. And that's also going to be the need to do something very old-fashioned like we used to do in strikes, which is to raise money to support people. Not to professionalize the movement. You know, don't get me wrong, but if people are literally thrown out of a job or fired because of their activities and movements, there's got to be some form of collective sustenance now. Otherwise, you will have the stories which you and I are only too familiar with. I once was a radical, and then I grew up. I swore at 16 I was never going to grow up. <laughs> um, I swore I would continue to say until my last breath, I am a socialist, I am a socialist. And uh, the people who became cynical, in a sense, are oftentimes the ones who didn't end up as the three of us did. God only knows how I did. Uh, as senior professors in relatively elite universities. Um, and we have to kind of own up to what that means for us and what that means for the young people in the movement. Thank you, Drusilla, for those rousing last words. I'd like you all to join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful